I'm going to record this session. So don't say anything threatening or illegal. Because <laughs> what you can, what you do or say can be held against you in a court of law, I guess. Okay, good, Brian, it's all yours. Okay, great, thank you. Well, Mark, thank you for having me. And thank you, class. It looks like we've got Rowan, Cameron, and Sunshine. So hello, am I saying your name correctly, Rowan? Is that, yeah? Hello, Rowan and Cameron and Sunshine. And we have Athena right over here, which you'll, you'll probably see Athena here shortly because I'm going to call on her for some um, assistance, I think. So let's see. I am thinking that you probably can see the whiteboard pretty well. So this is what they can see. Okay, thank you. So I'll make it real big. But everybody, what I want to start with today is the idea that when we're speaking in front of other people, we've got two big buckets. And the first bucket is what we say. And the second bucket is how we say it. So let's just sort of think about those two things for a moment. What we say and how we say it. Which one do you think in, is a more important Bucket, what we say or how we say it. They're both important. It, they are both important. Maybe yeah. how we say it is a little bit more important because of the rhetorical design. Okay. So Athena is saying maybe that how we say it is maybe a little bit more important. Now, of course, they're both very important. But you're absolutely right. So I'm A plus, I mean, for you today, you're absolutely right. How we say it is actually more important. And here's why nonverbal communication is what falls in the bucket of how we say it. So when we think about verbal or nonverbal communication, verbal means the words we're saying, the words we're writing. Words, words, and words. Have you ever heard that old expression that talk is cheap? <laughs> the old expression talk is cheap comes from the idea or, or reflects the idea that the how we say it is actually more important. So I've got um, Athena here. And if I, yeah, come on up. Oh, if you, do you mind? Helping me a little bit. There's, there's, you know, public speaking and public presentation. There's so much. So here's Athena. So if I say to Athena, "Oh, Athena, I'm sorry, I just, or, excuse me, wait, Athena, I'm sorry, I just nudged you. Sorry, I nudged you. I'm sorry, I nudged you, Athena. Do you believe me? No. <laughs> but if it, Athena, I'm sorry, I nudged you." Do you believe me? Yes. Okay, so in time two, the difference was all kinds of variation in my tone and in my voice and in my vocal quality. The first time was, I'm sorry, I'm not doing Athena, right? And it was, it, was, it sounds really like it's, I'm just going growling, it's, it's from my gut. It's like it's a chore to have to say sorry because it's something that you have to do. So, the, exactly. So, the idea is remember that I asked you, what do you believe? The idea is all about what do we believe in all of this? And so we want to believe our speaker. We want to believe what you're telling us. And in this information age, and in an age where we're never really ever quite sure what to believe, we need the how we say it to be on point so that people will believe us. Even if maybe even if we're not telling the truth, even if we're faking it, or even if we're sort of, you know, faking it. Now, in in this case, like a politician, <laughs> it's really what you, sort of what you just said. So actually, everyone, the statistics show in our communication studies that you said maybe it's a little bit more important. It's actually 90% or more of what we believe in another human being is nonverbal. It's not really what the words are. It's actually how you're presenting it. So now let's let's crosswalk this to like the idea of your presentations. 
So you're thinking about now specifically making a research or a scholarly project presented in the, in the front of the room. Well, when you do that, you're like going for what's called an authoritative tone. So let's talk about tone. I'm going to put tone in the bucket. I don't know if you can see that so terribly well, but I'm going to put tone in this bucket, which we just sort of demonstrated with the, the fake apology. But here, I want to give you or introduce the concept or the term of an authoritative tone, an authoritative tone. You don't want an authoritarian tone. You do not want that. Authoritarian tone is be quiet, go to sleep, do this, I'm, eat, your, eat your dinner. Like, that's authoritarian. And it's not effective. When we try to use an authoritarian tone with people, all of the time, people are silently flipping us their middle finger in their mind and thinking that they're going to do the opposite of, of, of what we're authoritarian, being authoritarian about. On the flip side, a shade difference with authoritative, though, is that we human beings, we like to respond to authoritative people, especially when they're telling us what to do and not what not to do, but they're giving us direction and telling us ideas of what we might and should be doing with, with an idea, right? And offering us guidance. If it's in an authoritative tone, then it will work really well. So here the big idea is mastering tone or mastering tonality. And so I'd have to ask each of you, and, and frankly, I have to just be perfectly honest and tell you, uh, it's very difficult to teach public speaking without people right, right there. <laughs> um, but I'm going to do my best. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try because I've got Athena and I've got Professor Hathley right here as well. Um, but with practicing tonality, sometimes we are maybe intuitive about this and we have really good skills already built in where we can not only encode a particular tone, encode means like that I'm in control of my tone and I'm aware of my tone and then I can deliver it the way that I want it to be delivered. And also maybe we're intuitive in the way that we decode tone, um, meaning that I'm not sensitive to your tone and I, I, like, I understand how, how your tone is. But, not everyone has that intuitively and not everyone has that special sort of gift or ability to be able to do that really well and really easily. Guess what everybody? And so this is like a little side note to, to this lecture. This bucket and tone is also known as social skills. <laughs> All right. We talk about soft skills and social skills. There's another name for this kind of stuff and it is, it is social skills. Being able to do that encoding and do that decoding for the benefit of the subject, such as like when I think about the subject, like authoritative delivery, or the feelings of the subject, such as in the case of an apology, um, and also just being effective and getting done what you want, what you want to get done with, with that tone. Now you can fake tone, obviously. You can you can fabricate, you can make things up, you can perform it. And so that goes back to that whole idea of sort of believability and and um, maybe even confidence in yourself in, in presentation. I think could you agree that tone is confidence or, or the confidence is a particular kind of tone? I would say so. You want to bring confidence to the front of the room. You want to bring confidence to what you're saying and how you're saying it. So now let's add confidence to the bucket and think about more ways that confidence is demonstrated in a speaking and listening experience. So we have, we put tone here already, but now let's think about body language. So I'm going to do it for demonstration. Please continue to stay standing if you don't mind because you're but I'm going to come up to kind of to the front where you guys can see me. I'm going to walk off and I'm going to re-enter and I'm going to use a particular kind of body language in regards to this conversation that we're having right now about confidence. Okay. Here's way number one.
My body language in time one is not expressing confidence. You are in control of your body, even if you don't necessarily kind of think that in your approach to the front of the room. So let me try a different approach. I'd be like the cameraman. Okay. Now. I'm doing kind of a power pose, a power posture. I have my feet at squarely situated underneath my, my shoulders. My hands are in control. I have them either maybe behind me or just to the side. I'm aware if I want to make a gesture this way or this way, I'm looking straight ahead, so on and so forth. I maybe am aware of my breath and my gut or here. I'm going to try and use some confidence. You know, and so let's workshop a little bit of tone and body language and confidence, Athena, just right now, okay? So catch the ball and just don't look at the answers and just read one question. If you were granted one wish, what would it be? If you were granted one wish, what would it be? I want you to take just a moment, Athena, to think about that. Do you have an answer? Don't give it, just do that one again. Yeah? yeah? Yes. Okay. Athena, what I would like for you to do is I'd like for you to walk off and walk on and tell the people in the screen what your one wish would be in just a few sentences, you know, in some amount of time that makes sense for you. What's that? Body language? And I want you to see if see if you can incorporate body language and tone and confidence to seem. Are you ready for this? To seem, and I use a very magic word in more advanced public speaking, which is seem. Yes. To seem authoritative. To seem authoritative. So, and the, so you had two different definitions of authoritative. Okay, let's work that. So you had uh, the authoritative. You, you don't want authoritarian. Authoritarian is come to class every time, be on time, be here, or or my way or the highway. This is authoritarian. Bossy? Yeah. Authoritarian is bossy. Do what I say. Go to sleep. You know, authoritative is I am confident. I am here. I have you. You can trust me. I can give you a message. Speak knowledgeably, knowledgeably about this message and you'll believe me and we can go forward and progress and be effective. Right? Okay. That's Aggression versus assertion. So. It is that is a great analogy. It is like aggression versus versus assertion. Aggr you can associate aggression with authoritarian and assertive with authoritative. So we what we want for each of you as engaged scholars is an authoritative presentation where we can believe in you as the speaker and we can believe what you're telling us about the subject. You know that, that there's that there's credibility there. Now all you have to do in this exercise is you just simply have to give a little demonstration about if you had one wish, what you would wish for. But make Professor Hathley and me believe you through that idea of being using your body language, using your tone to just give a few sentences or however much you want, you know, to sort of tell us that we believe you because you're you're authoritative, you're credible. You are not going to come up and do the. It's not that. Okay. Yeah. Give it a whirl. Tell the people in there. So, Athena, so, first, let's have you approach. Come back here with me. And go ahead and make the make the approach to the front of the room. If I had one wish, I would wish. That I have better mental health, a healthier perspective on my thoughts and my dreams and my patterns, better self discipline to change those things and become more efficient with my thinking and my emotional intelligence. Now, let's do it again. There will be two changes. The, 
The first change, Athena, is you'll be a little bit less what we call performative. Performative is, is like uh, if we were entertaining. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We'll we'll dial down that aspect of sort of entertainment just a little bit. So less. Hello, my name is Athena. Yeah. It's, it'll be a little bit more uh, contained, and then we'll have you on thoughts, feelings, and patterns. I think you said. Was that? I think that was the, the three said. I want to have you try something. What is called a planned gesture. And we're going to use a tiny little snippet. All you have to work in again is thoughts, feelings, expressions, right? I think that's what you asked. Yeah. And I'd like for you to come here and give me your left, your left hand. I want you to count off thoughts, feelings, expressions. Can you do it on these three fingers and with this finger here? Can you use your right finger to count? Go like this. Thoughts, feelings, expressions. Try that again. Thoughts. Feelings, expressions. Try it again. Thoughts, feelings, expressions. It doesn't even matter what the words or what the gestures are. What matters is that we're practicing now. Okay. The magic word there is practice. Before we give a presentation, we practice. And for an authoritative experience, you want to have in that practice at least one planned gesture. A planned gesture is something that you plan. You, you figure out ahead of time, I'm going to use this gesture. It forces you to practice and it forces you to match your body language with your words. Thoughts, feelings, expre ex expressions, right? That's it. Oh, patterns. Sorry. Thoughts, feelings, patterns. Patterns is for thoughts, feelings, expressions. Oh, well, that's up to you. Because <laughs> all three of those can associate with. She just said maybe expressions is better than patterns. So she wanted to go back to the what we say bucket, which is perfectly fine. And that's the work also of the scholar and of the of the presenter is to always be figuring out what is in the how we say bucket, what is in the what we say bucket, and how am I how am I adjusting and changing and the, the, you, you get more masterful as a speaker when you start to do exactly that. Because then you can match even your tone to the word. Like you might say the word expressions differently than you say the word patterns. You know, you might even have a different uh, different facial expression. But what I'm forcing, if we're in the practice or coaching, is you to get the idea that when you're getting ready to make a presentation, the practice means okay, I'm gonna build in a planned gesture. Thoughts, feelings, patterns, or expressions. Okay. Thoughts, feelings, and expressions. And then if you're a person who you probably are not all people that that uh, present often or a lot of the time, but if you are, then what happens is that your planned gestures can turn into what are called signature gestures. So a signature gesture, I think that the former President Donald Trump had about five to ten really strong signature gestures, and most politicians do, in fact, although I'm not sure what Biden's are at this point, but um, they do, in fact. You may even, if you do attend a lot of meetings in your profession or in your job, you can even start to recognize when you're using authoritative gestures from this, which is a how we say it kind of technique. I have one colleague, her signature gesture is she puts out her arm like this as though it is a piece of paper. When she what she's like, if she's thinking or wants to make a point, all of a sudden that left arm goes out. We've got a piece of paper here, and she starts going like this: one, two, three, four, and she starts showing us one, two, three, four things on that piece of paper. It's a signature gesture for her. Why does that matter? It helps us believe her. It helps her sense of being authoritative, right? And we also start to um, feel that she's really confident in her body language, and that she's maybe even planned her speech, or that she is that she just kind of is credible. She knows what she's what she's talking about. It almost brings like who influences physical. Yeah. It totally brings, and for those people who have that, that body bodily kinesthetic um, energy. It really brings that sort of muscle memory and that whole idea into, into play of like matching words to your body and all of those kinds of things. So we've got tone in play. We've got body language in play. For tone, I asked you to be less performative. For body language, I'm giving you a planned gesture to match to your words. We're still going with confidence. The, the question is still if you had one wish. Okay. And um, 
Professor Hathley, don't turn the camera. We'll just let her walk up. Okay. Okay. So um, come back and let's try it again. And I'd like to now introduce Athena Landy to speak about one wish. Athena? If I had one wish, it would be to have healthier thoughts, emotions, and expressions. Now, she just tried that little that little bit. If any, anyone there could tell us, was that better, do you think, than the first round that she tried? What do you guys think? Better. It was better. That's sunshine. Thank you. How about you, Cameron? Do you have any ideas? More like a TED talk? Better for Cameron? <laughs> any comments, Ro? Uh, not really. I just, uh, I see a lot of personality, but I think more genuineness would probably be better and a little bit of confidence. Okay. Maybe. I don't know. So, okay. So Go. you bring up a great point. That's Rowan or Ro? Ro, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ro, you bring up a great point, and that is the idea of authenticity in these experiences as well. So we really want to address that. So authenticity or that sense of, he, I think he just said genuineness, yeah. is also in, it, it, it's really inherent, and, and it's in here. Because, you know, if you craft your words with authenticity, you're probably going to say them with authenticity. Yeah. Um, so how do we achieve a sense of authenticity then in a, in a, something like this? One way, Ro and everyone, is to think about the mantra of be true to you. You want to be true to you in the experience with your word choices and just with the whole entire thing. So, in other words, if being true to you means that you bring candy for the audience and that you want to, you are a person who wants to feed this audience and bring them candy. And you're like, but should I bring them candy? Because is that professional? Is that, is that um, authoritative? Like, you know, Professor Weaver taught us. The answer is yes. If that's really you, bring the candy. Or definitely the, your wardrobe and, and what you're wearing has everything to do with your sense of authenticity. And so we often, and I'll often teach about authenticity with, through clothing and through wardrobe in our public speaking classes because you want to be true to you at the same time you also do want to balance with being professional and you also want to you know try to be authoritative if that's the if that's the tone of the speech all at the same time so the more things we add into the bucket and the more things we try to practice the harder and harder and more and more difficult all of this gets because then you're trying to think okay i want to do my confidence with my authenticity my body language my tone then what if we think about my rate of speech is like I go fast. So if we think rate, if we think volume or projection of speech, let's go ahead. Nina. I had trouble with the very, very beginning. Like, should I say hello? Should I say my name? Should I say? But I just wanted to say it's like answering. Let's keep with one wish and let's try again, but this time we're going to ask you to infuse in her Rose feedback, some additional authenticity through a little introduction of yourself first. So this time I'm going to ask you to try it again, but have it be with my name is Athena Landy. I am, and then give us like a little bit of who you uh, of who you are. Maybe I'm a scholar. I am a something major. I'm a mother. I I am a beautiful and fantastic human being who deserves the world. Um, whatever you want to say, but a little something about yourself, right? And then say, and if I had one wish, Athena. Now, like th everybody, this is where I'm showing you how we're scaffolding to make this harder and harder. Now I'm asking her to think about the approach confidently. I'm asking her to think about 
confidence. I'm asking you to think about being authoritative and not necessarily just performative. I'm asking you to think about your body language, which is the one and the two and the three. And at the same time, we're asking you to infuse a sense of authenticity of like, this is me. This is who I really am. This is, this is the truth that I'm true to me. All right, so let's, let's give it another world. Come on off and I'll introduce you. Lots to think about. Okay, welcome to Athena Landy, who's going to be speaking to us today about wishes. Hello, I'm Athena Landy, and I am an advocate for healthier systemic accountability. And if I had one wish, I'd wish for healthier, oh, <laughs> healthier emotions, healthier thoughts and healthier expressions. These are all systemic understandings within the body. Oh man, I added No, you're of... doing, you are doing perfectly. You're just doing so well. Do you feel authentic in that process? Yes. Um, or do you feel like I'm just trying to make you into something you're not? No. Uh, I, I was thinking about my nickname, like saying my nickname instead of my birth name. And I think that kind of like threw me off a little bit. And then also I was trying to find the words that I was going to say and uh, bridge in what I said at first, because I th had to think of something to introduce myself being. So um, an advocate for healthier systemic accountability. And if I had one wish, if I had one wish, it would be for myself, or be to have healthier thoughts, emotions, and expressions. Fist bump. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to walk all the way to the back of the room, so you on WebEx will not be able to see me, but I'm going to walk all the way to the back of the room. Your job, Athena, is to do it again, which by the way, you, you deserve like a million dollars after <laughs> Oh, yeah, you're going to just be poached once I've done another one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to walk all the way to the back of the room, and your job is to do the exact same thing again, but this time you're going to introduce yourself, then you're going to ask the audience, which will be me, how I'm doing today. Okay. And you're going to have to get your voice to land on me. Now, wait a minute. Nobody wants to be yelled at. <laughs> Nobody likes, so the difference between volume and projection is this. Volume is when I'm just yelling at you, right? And nobody wants to be yelled at. <laughs> projection is the idea that your voice and so will they wear a mask when they're presenting? I was going to take it off. Yeah, usually they that will allow them to drop it down so they can actually get better. Okay. A um, little better volume projection. The idea of the idea of projection is that your voice is like visible. Like think about that if there was stardust or a rainbow in your voice, that there's you could actually like see your voice. Well, I'm gonna <laughs> if that were the case, some people's voices will come out this far and then just stop right there. And you might still be able to hear the person, maybe if their volume is high enough. But what we really want everybody is for you to project your voice in such a way that if we could see it, it would go all the way back to the back of the room. And so you will only have seven of you, but I'm here to teach you some strategies in case there, there, were be, there would ever be more or in case you were ever in front of a larger group of people, and then maybe there was not even a microphone, so on and so forth. So again, this takes practice. So Athena, you're my partner today. So I want you to we'll look back at your beautiful drawing, okay? And I'm going to try to get my voice to get on to your beautiful drawing. Right now, my voice is stopping kind of maybe here or inside my face shield, but you all can still hear me. But if I actually look to her drawing at the back of the room, and I start thinking about my tone and I'm going to pull it from my gut and try to 
actually maybe get my voice to go that far. And so now I could get an echo. I'm not exactly yelling at you, but I'm projecting my voice to the back of the room. And if I start to do that as a habit, I'm not exactly yelling, maybe a little bit louder, but more just focused on having my voice travel and go that direction. So if you're a very soft spoken person, Hello, my name is Brian Weaver, and today I think your voice is stopping here. That will lessen your sense of authoritativeness by a lot. Now, to Rose's point, what if you would say, and this is advanced public speaking, this part right now, but if just this part, what if you would say, well, but my authentic self is to have a soft voice? All right, well, then you need a microphone. Then you would then you would need a microphone to sort of compensate for that if it's actually impeding the rest of the audience from hearing you. What if we said, okay, but I want to be my authentic self and I'm soft spoken and I'm shy and I don't have a microphone. Then it's not an accessible presentation. So then you would have to ask yourself, do I want to sacrifice some of my authenticity and practice a performative skill of vocal projection to the back of the room? Or you know, how do you kind of want to want to handle that? So again, balancing some of these ideas of confidence with authenticity and volume, all these things is difficult. Like right, this can actually take quite a bit, quite a bit of practice and quite a bit of work. Athena, if real estate, sunshine, hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> if if real estate is location, 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 have you ever heard that that phrase? If you're in the real estate biz, it's location, location, location. We know what that means. It means there's one thing that's important in real estate, location. And then if there's a second thing that's important, it's location. If there's a third thing that's important, it's location. <laughs> in speaking to a before a group of six, seven people, 10 people, 50 people, 100 people, it's practice, 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 right? So. You want to start now. I don't know Professor Huckley's timeline for all of you and how much you, you how far you are into your research projects and your presentations and so on and so forth. But it's time to start now. And with you're getting you're getting the same stuff I would do with it at, at, for professional people. I mean to to give them the practice in real time. What would you do if you didn't have some, an experience like that? You would practice for your stuffed animals. You would practice for your family, for your friends, for the mirror. You just keep doing it over and over and over again until you start to become more and more comfortable with your planned gestures, with um, your tonality, and all the things that we're learning, your, your body language, all the things we're learning today. Your job now, you will introduce, you will speak to me at the back of the room and ask me how I am doing after you've introduced yourself. I'll answer, and then you'll get going with your presentation on if you had one wish. And you'll try to incorporate as many of the things I've taught you today as possible. Here's one more. <laughs> if you mess up, try not to show us. Because Professor Hathley and Sunshine have absolutely, and, and Roe and Cameron, have absolutely no clue whether or not you have messed up. So you only reveal that to us by showing us that you have messed up. Here's what I do when I mess up and I don't and I'm and I don't want to show that I've messed up. I pause. That's back to kind of that rate where we don't want to go too terribly fast. I pause and look at something neutral like maybe the clock. And I take a breath and just sort of think for a second, all as though it's like a dramatic pause. So I've just messed up. I called you Kathy. And Athena, let's begin. You see what you see? Instead of doing the oh gosh, gosh, gosh darn it. <laughs> instead of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hey everybody. <laughs> so you're all good. You're all good. Uh -oh. We've got a, a better guess. Yes. So you can get on the class. Okay, thank you. Feels better than everybody. <laughs> everybody. Hi, SGA. I'm Brian Weaver. Brian Weaver, PTK. Brian Weaver, PTK. Couple the acronyms. Oh, <laughs> this <no>. pups. 
Yeah, we want to. We actually want to do so to relieve all the student work that they're doing. For COVID. So we can eat and just. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So for the content, we'll see you in a minute. You have something to come back. You didn't know. So now we just got more authentic. Would you like to <laughs> we did. Would you like to just spend time on Charlotte or would you like to take it's totally up to you? Can we give it a little try? We can try it. Yeah. While holding him? Or would you want to let him talk? Do you want to give it a shot since, since you're here just to get a little do oh, or two acting yeah. there? And we can trade places. Yeah. Okay. Come on up. Are we talking about wishes or we're talking about wishes? Okay. It was by unless do do what would you like any questions? It's totally up to you. No, we can do wishes. You want to do wishes? Yeah. It's if you hi, I'm very weird. I'm sunshine. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Love, love this. Hey. Um so you just got here, so I think I had taught her about five different things. You know, we'll start you, I think, maybe back just a little bit. I will, unless you want to go for the all five. Let's do it. You okay. want to just go for all You want to go for all five? Yeah. I did speech in the base, like in high school. Oh, so, so you're all yeah. yeah. Perfect. I'm ready for five. Topic. <laughs> if you have one wish, and you're going to introduce yourself <laughs> first. <laughs> right after you introduce yourself, you'll look to me, project your voice, and ask me how I'm doing. Interact with me for a little bit. I'll tell you. You go back, come back and then tell us what that one wish is. All while your tone is authoritative, right? We want to believe you. And per row, we'd also like to see a sprinkling in of authenticity. And we'll start with actually an approach. So if you want to start from here, I'm I'll go back there. Okay. I was thinking of my wish really fast. Yes, that's important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it. Hi everyone, I'm Sunshine. Uh, welcome to my presentation. How are you today? Doing well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. That's good to hear. So today I'm here to talk to you about my one wish if I had one. And it would definitely be to always have unlimited resources so that I could be at the top of my success. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> good. <laughs> yo, yo, keep it up. Oh, okay. yeah. You did a beautiful job. Thanks. Sunshine, please come to the front. Yes. <laughs> We're going to ask you to do this again, and at this time, I'd like for you to practice a dramatic pause. Okay. All right. So we'll see how you can be comfortable, silent in front of the room for a few moments. I think the dramatic pause can come after you address me. See if you can take three whole moments to stand in confidence without speaking. Can you do it? Yeah. <laughs> Let's try the whole thing again. Seems uh, so. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to my TED Talk. <laughs> it's a TED Talk now. Um, my name is Sunshine. How are you doing today? So, today I'm here to talk to you about my one wish if I had one, and that would be to always have unlimited resources at my disposal. Disposal. So I could be the best that I ever could be. Thank you. <laughs> that was really difficult. Pause. Yeah. You can have a seat if you want. <laughs> so, first of all, fantastic work. Secondly, from the back of the room, I could just barely hear that you took a breath during that pause. So we need to talk about breath. Everyone, in order to find your confidence, in order to find your sense of authenticity, find your tone, find yourself, we have to figure out where from inside 
this part of ourselves, we are starting. So from right here to right here is where people start in public speaking. We say you either feel it in your heart or you feel it in your gut. And it's really kind of up to you. And maybe this sounds a little bit like hocus pocus, but it really is not hocus pocus. Decide when you're speaking about something that you care about, do you think you feel it here? Or do you think you feel it here? And usually it's just one way or the other for a person like consistently. I am a gut person, but I know other people who are heart people. Whichever way you choose, when you're breathing, you want to try and like think about your energy and your breath coming from that place because that's like your central like place. That's your special spot. So I don't know which your spot was sometime when you took your breath, but breathing is so important beforehand, during, and after. I remember when I was in communication school, learning to do public speaking and learning to do all of the communications, someone tried to teach me this. And I remember when they were teaching me this, that I thought it was full. I thought like, who cares? Like we're talking about, honestly, like that's not important. Nothing could be further from the truth. Your breath is so important for your presentation. It, your body listens to your mind and your mind listens to your body. So when we breathe our anxiety and we think about our words and our emotions and we breathe them through, we breathe them out before, during, and after, that is a central and very key and essential part of the whole presentation process. Step one, decide is your breath coming from here or is your breath coming from here? So if I think it's coming from here, I'm always centrally located here, and I personally use a gesture to match my gut when I need it. Whether or not people interpret it or understand it or care is irrelevant. If I'm having a difficult day, a difficult presentation, and I need to find a little bit of energy, I, you are going to find me with my fist near this part of my gut, and I can actually soothe myself with this, with this gesture because I'm aware that I've got energy there. Other professional speakers may touch their heart or fist to their heart, and they know that's where they're getting that, that energy from. That's where those words reside that are being projected. That's where the breath needs to come from. Okay, so if you have the anxiety, remember, use your breath. Your body listens to your mind. Your mind listens to your body, and it will all be good if you can kind of find that, that spot. In a pause, and the reason why I went with a pause, even though I'm not writing in that on the board, is because I don't know these two people that I've worked with today are advanced speakers and very, very intuitive and advanced speakers. <laughs> you all, Rowan and Cameron, I don't know your, your ability or your skill at this point. So what I guess I'm saying is if you are at a high ability, you can start to practice more advanced things like the use of pauses. And remember how Sunshine, who said, oh, I did this in high school, who just also said to me, that was hard. <laughs> pauses are one of the hardest things that you can do. But in conclusion to this whole pause thing, pauses can also communicate a lot of authoritative credibility because it shows that you're comfortable in your own skin and you're comfortable in your own body enough to be able to pause. So I maybe have an audience of 50. And in my presentation, if I had one wish, I would be able to fly anywhere in the world that I wanted to go at any time on any day and be able to fly back again with freedom. Why would I wish that? I wish that because I feel a sense of brotherhood with our world and our community since this pandemic. And the pauses are difficult. They slow my rate down and I already speak too fast. And if we can make eye contact and pause, 
I might seem that much more comfortable or that much more confident in my own skin. And that's a lot of what I wanted to teach you today. So in conclusion, and then I'll let you ask me any questions that you want for whatever time we have remaining. Please be aware of the relationship between what you're saying and how you're saying it. Be aware that people believe things in the how you say it bucket. It's people do not necessarily believe what you are saying. They believe how you say it. And so in a presentation like the one you're making for Professor Heffley and your class and engaged scholars, you want to try to use an authoritative tone. You want to practice, practice, practice with things like planned gestures. You want to practice with things like vocal projection to the back of the room. You want to practice with things like, am I being true to me though? And is this really who I am? Am I expressing a sense of authenticity? If I want to bring candy, I'll bring candy. If I want to wear a tie, I'll wear a tie. I wore a tie, but I didn't button it up because it's Friday, right? That's this little sense of authenticity. <laughs> um, you want to think about your body language. You want to think about your overall tonality, all of these kinds of things, and that thereby have the most effective presentation that you possibly can. So that's all I've got for you today. And now I would like to spend whatever time we have left remaining um, just chatting with any questions or any ideas. Or if you disagree with anything that I talked about today, um, then you feel free to challenge me and we'll have that conversation as well. Let's start with Ro and Cameron. So Ro, Cameron, do you guys have any ideas, comments? What would you think about altering the state of the environment where we gave the presentation. Is that a question for Professor Hathley or for me? Uh, probably for you, Brian. All for you, Brian. Yeah. Like, say, instead of doing it indoors, we were to do it outdoors instead. Would that if be more beneficial? I personally am a huge fan of changing the environment as much as possible when you want to, for whatever reasons. Like, I rearrange furniture. I will, I will resituate people. I'll change lights. I'll do anything and everything I want to do for that environment to help it be as conducive to me and the audience as possible. Better word than conducive to have it be as awesome for me and the audience as, as possible. If you go outside, let's hope that you know how to project your voice because often um, the outdoors provides a lot of extraneous noise and it's more difficult to kind of contain the, the, uh, your voice, but you can do it. You can't contain it, but you can project it. So I say, go for it. And in all of my classes, uh, I will invite students to have any configuration of the room that they want, so long as they can, you know, manage it, in, in whatever, uh, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. I've had people give presentations from in the center of the room and have people like encircle them. Um, anything you want to do, progressive, traditional, lectern. Here I don't have a lectern. Um, sometimes I do have a lectern. I will also tell you that in my public speaking engagements, sometimes I will roam amongst the audience, and sometimes it, I, it, you don't have, you see, you get a vibe for the audience, you get a feel, you read your audience. Sometimes I will walk right up to people and speak to them at, at a distance like this, and other times I'll, I'll hang way back and not approach my audience at all. So some of that is a vibe, um, some of that is a plan, but always I'm in favor of changing <laughs> your environment, always. What a darling baby. Can I pick him up? <laughs> you are so darling. <laughs> He's all like, wait a minute. It's like. <laughs> Other questions? I have a question. Sunshine. Um, would you say with public speaking, it's better to have a strong outline or a set speech? Mm. When you say a set speech, you mean a scripted speech? A scripted speech, fully scripted. So this is all of the things that we're talking about and da 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 and I'm going through it, you know, practicing that five minute speech for a month, or is it better to have the outline of like. The very best way is if you have a scripted speech that's memorized where you, it's you it's fake memorized where you the people can't tell you've memorized it. Mm -hmm. Where you can give a memorized speech as though it's not memorized. Okay. But that is highly performative. 
if you can do that, go for it because then you're so confident because you've got that speech memorized and you can give it, you know, in a way that's that, that people don't can tell that you've memorized it. They can tell you memorized it when you're searching for it, when you're like, my name is Brian Weaver and I live in it's Denver, Colorado. And when you're searching and then that's like a memorization experience that we don't need to see. Yeah. You know? But by and large, for the majority of, of, of experiences, the outline is best because then you can just be free to sort of go, you can put your finger on the outline where you are, speak what you know, speak your content, speak your subject, and then come back to your outline and, and be able to kind of volley or jockey between the two. So that's what, it, what most people do. Would an example of that be kind of like one of the higher level like campaign speeches, like a, like a nomination acceptance speech? Sure. Where they largely have it memorized. Well, they used to back in the day. <laughs> yeah. But it was all performance art because they're trying to convince people to vote for them. Exactly. And not for the other guy. And so they're kind of, you can tell they've got it memorized, even if they are kind of reading it on the teleprompter. But I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen a teleprompter. If you have to read that like the first time, you're not going to do well. <laughs> So it's like you largely know your speech, right? Is that an example of like a polished, perfect, and memorized? Yeah. Absolutely perfect example. Exactly. And I, I really think that the point about authenticity and performativeness is an, is an important one, but it's more advanced by far. So I got to get a little snapshot there. They are. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Cameron, anything from you? Okay, so um, if I can just kind of follow up from uh, what Brian was talking about, sort of maybe kind of segue it into what we're doing specifically here in class. Some of you are kind of thinking, it's like, okay, this is great, but why? <laughs> right? So here's the point, right? Because basically what we've been talking about the entire semester is, based, is academic conversations, right? Enjoying a conversation and adding our scholarship to the conversation. And so we've all been in conversations which um, where some of the conversationalists are somewhat, how should we say, politely ungifted <laughs> um, or um, otherwise you kind of don't believe them or they're kind of off the wall. And it's like, OK, so where are we going with this conversation? I didn't get anything out of this one. Right. And so since uh, the reason why I like. Uh, Brian to do this is because ultimately what we're talking about is communication, right? So the idea is. We can answer a fantastic question that could be worthy of the Nobel Prize, right? But if we can't communicate it to others and convince them that it is worthy of a Nobel Prize by the way we communicate it, then it goes nowhere. So success in scholarship is equal parts investigation with communication. And that's, I think, where you get to your two buckets. Yeah where you get to what we say, which is what we're focusing on in our methodology, and how we say it, which is where we get to our presentation. And adding the two together, basically, is where we're trying to get to. So if you're wondering, which you may or may not, that's why we're here. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. And today we're focused on professionalism and authoritativeness. <clears throat> Everything you just said, you can see how these skills transfer even to your personal life. I mean, quite frankly, it may sound silly, but these skills transfer to like dating. Yeah. You know, because what you say and, and how you say it and our, even our personal relationships. If I tell my son, turn the dryer on when I get home and make sure the lights are, are, are set appropriately. I can just guarantee that he won't do that. <laughs> right? Because it was in my tone. It was in how I said that. Right? It didn't sunshine just laughed at it. It was, but if I said, son, turn the dryer on for me before I get home and see if we can get the flight set. And my tone just changes that much. My mm -hmm. personal relationship changes. He's more likely to be like, well, okay, dad. Yeah. You know? So, and again, but this is a case of believing and engaging in a scholarly way with a conversation that may really matter and may be worthy of the Nobel Prize, like you were just saying. Um, but we're socialized to listen for clues and cues in the communication about authoritativeness, about credibility, about confidence in order to sort of believe it and in order to continue to engage with it and engage with it at a high level or engage with it well. 
if we don't get those cues or those clues, we tend to start thinking about what we're having for dinner that night. So Cameron just chimed in with a question. Cameron, are, are you able to hear us now? I know you had mic problems, so you're probably not able to uh, speak to us, but are you able, are you able to hear us okay? Good. Okay. So his question is, um, when presenting a live speech, what is good practice for asking rhetorical uh, questions to the audience with the intention, uh, or, or excuse me, is it asking rhetorical questions or questions to the audience with the intention of answering it ourselves? Or more specifically, is it something you don't want to overdo to ask too many of those questions to the audience and answer it for the audience? Cameron, I do it all the time. This is something, this is actually something I'm maybe known for is I'm always questioning the audience, but without the intention that they actually answer. So this is, this is how I, I do it. I'd be like, um, let's see. So I just want to ask you, are you comfortable with public speaking? Now you don't have to answer that yourselves. You don't have to answer that out loud, but let me ask you again. Are you comfortable with public speaking? Is this something you actually enjoy to do? If you were say paid to give a speech tomorrow, how much money would it actually take to convince you to give that speech? Then you don't have to answer this. I just want you to be thinking about it. But you have it, have that in your mind as we're going along. So I get I sandwich in with the questions, little reminder for people on how to process all of those questions because I happen to know I'm going to continue to question them. If I want them to answer, I will preface with, now, everyone, I'm getting ready to ask you a question. I'm hoping I'm going to, you know, have a, one or two answers. I give, you know, give them a little time there. So, by a show of hands, I mean, when you're ready, just by a show of hands, how many of you would say you enjoy public speaking? Or and, then I'm, and then I'm yeah. going to wait. Right, exactly. exactly. So you see what I, what, what I mean? So you just kind of give them directions about how you want them to handle your, your, your questions. People really like that. Yeah. And Cameron, just from, we're not a public speaking, but just what I do with students in class is um, it's a little more technical. So I'm trying to get information out of them. Um, well, Sunshine, you, you know this because you took my class. Um, but a lot of times what I'll do is I'll ask questions and I'll answer for them. Because number one is it's not necessarily I'm not it's not a question I'm necessarily hung up on that I want to give you that time to answer it. I'm actually trying to move you someplace, and I don't want us to get stopped there. But I ask it as a question, as a, as in close to a statement, because it shakes you into a different brain space. Then if I were to just to state that factoid, just straight, most of the class would not even register it. But as soon as I ask it as a question. Then it shakes the students into a different place. Now, all of a sudden, they're like, whoa, 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 what, what is that? And now, all of a sudden, I got your attention, and then I answer the question for you. So now that I, that I, that I know you're with me. So I kind of use it as a way to sort of, I don't want to say kind of rein in the leash a little bit, just to kind of make sure that you're all with me before we cross the street. That's great. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm, a, I'm same way. I, I love to question people as a, as a technique. Yeah. Yeah, because I think people like to be questioned, and it does kind of wake them up. A good question, Cameron. <laughs> yeah. So Cameron just followed up. The goal is to make the audience aware of the question, but not be asking them to answer it themselves. That's his question. As a as a question, he just said that. Yeah. Really, Cameron, that's totally your choice. What you just asked is your choice. You get to decide if you want the audience to actually answer you or not. That's up to you. So if you don't act, if you want to question them for the sake of like what Professor Hefley was just saying, or you want to question them because you're, that's just your style and it's fun, but you don't really want them to answer, then use my technique of, of telling them, you don't need to answer this. This is not for answering out loud. I just want you to be thinking. Ask, ask yourself or ask this question. Let me ask, let me pose you this for you to think about. Give them the, give them the instruction to not answer. Or if you personally prefer that you want to field questions in an audience interaction experience where you're like, I, I want them to answer this. I want to go around, I'm going to take four. Then you plan that. That's something that you plan in your practice. And then you're going to have the question. And then you, and you again, give them the instructions. 
So everyone, I'm getting ready to ask you an evocative question about public speaking. I'm going to, I'm calling on a few of you. I'd like for you to please raise your hand when you have an idea about what amount of money would it take to get you to enjoy making a public presentation for a hundred or more people. Now think about that for a moment. I'm going to call on a few of you. The question is, how much money would it actually take to get you to the place where you would really want to give a public presentation to a hundred or more people? All right, by a show of hands, who would like to do it by raising your hand? Who would like to begin? Athena. Now, see, now I'm I'm giving instructions. I'm going to. But that's a plan. That's not something you decide on, on just on the whip usually in a presentation like this. You wouldn't be like, I'm taking questions actually, or I'm just going to be asking them questions that they don't answer. Yeah, and if I can also just to kind of foil off of that, of course, uh, Cameron, um, just to kind of I think because what Brian mentioned was two things. For first of all, you have the public speaking strategy of rhetorical versus feedback. Um, but then when I talked about the way I do it, you have to remember the goals are completely different because when you're teaching, you're also always aware of comprehension and whether or not your students are with you. So when I ask a question to shake the students up and then I answer for them and then I follow that up with a question and I pause and I expect them to answer, I'll actually rephrase the question and say, okay, I want you to answer this. And then I'll wait. And what I'll do oftentimes is I will actually use that as an opportunity. I don't know if sometimes I did this with you guys, but I do it more in person a lot. Is if the class is not coming up with a response, then I'll actually stop and I'll say, okay, if you're struggling to get this answer, you need to march, write this down. You need to know this before the exam. This is one of those moments of me telling you that this is an this is an idea that you have to have before you want to move forward. In the next content, so I kind of use that as a sort of a barometer check of where are you basically as a class? How comfortable are you feeling with this question? If you're not, then I want to, I want you to know you have work to do to get from here to where you need to be by the time we have the exam. So that's kind of what I do with questions when I'm sort of playing around with questions. I'm I'm literally poking at the class. I kind of poke at you guys all the time yeah. and look for signs of life. I mean, I know you probably have academic bruises from all of my poking because it was just the last semester, I think. Um, that yeah, in the spring. Yeah. So um, Sunshine took my bio class, so she knows exactly what I'm talking about. But that's so you have. So I think the, the message here is when we're talking about questions, rhetorical or strategic, there's a lot of different ways you can use them to generate different effects. Is that fair? Yeah, totally fair. A lot of different, and you plan it out in practice. Yeah. P plan it out in practice both ways. It's very stylistic. <clears throat> Excellent. Great questions, Cameron. As always. We miss you here in class. Just want you to know. You too, Ro. <laughs> well, everybody, thank you so much for having me. And it was really nice to meet some of you in person in person and some of you on, on WebEx. Professor Huffley, thank you so much for another year of being yep. invited back. It's my thank pleasure, you. my privilege always to spend a little bit of time and, and talk about these things. And I love meeting your son. Thank you. So, I've got one question for you guys, though, before you log off. Ro and Cameron, Sunshine and Athena, next week on our agenda, we are currently on the calendar to begin our, our presentations. So for the four of you that are here, are any of you feeling like you are ready to go for that presentation? What time is the presentation? So it would start at uh, normal class time at noon. And uh, we could do, you know, as many presentations in that hour and 15 minutes as we can, or we got two weeks to do presentations. But if for those of us who are ready to roll, I know, Ro, you got a lot of stuff that is already organized and a lot of stuff that you kind of have already at your fingertips. Um, and some of us are in different places. Uh, but for those of you who are at a place where you're like, yeah, I'm ready to do it. Let's get this presentation done. I want you to have that opportunity next week. For those of you who feel like I need to work on this a little bit more, we do have two weeks. So I want you. Uh, also, to be able to have an opportunity now to digest everything you've learned today. 
and to sort of unpack it a little bit and sort of pull some of that together and uh, target the following week. So I'm trying to look for week one and versus week two. Somebody said something in the chat. Uh, Cameron, okay. So Cameron uh, would rather go not next week, but the week after. Is that correct, Cameron? And that's fine. Attempt. So I don't want you to attempt. I want you to feel confident. I want you to feel like you're ready. Like you've got all of your, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to communicate with us what your plan is um, for, you know, your scholarly project. And so you want to make sure you're, you've kind of, you're, you're ready to do that, right? So if you're still kind of halfway in the middle of cooking the dish, you're not quite ready to serve. I want to make sure you guys have that chance to sort of finish out the meal. Why are the presentations next couple of weeks? In the way? Why are the presentations for the next two weeks and not later? Um, in December, we, we can. I typically try to do most of our face to face stuff before the break. Um, that's because half the time it's just natural. We tend to unravel after the break. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And there's not a lot of time to get yourself back. And so that's the reason why I want to try to get as much heavy lifting done before the break as possible. But right now, what's after the break is just basically meeting to kind of make sure we get ourselves moving towards spring. So I'm willing to schedule presentations um, after break as well. I just I want to make sure that you guys have all the opportunities to feel like you kind of are able to pull the presentation together and you're like, you know what, this is as good as it's going to get. I'm ready to plate the dish. That's where I want you to be before you do your presentation. Okay. Yeah, week two is going to be better for me. So week two for Sunshine, Cameron is week two. Athena's week two. Ro, how about you? How are you feeling? Um, I think I could. I could do it the first week. Uh, could we schedule a one-on-one -on -one to talk more about it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, shoot. So um, send me an email so we can um, take a look at our calendars and then um, we can set something up. We can do like we did last time. Um, like that kind of, uh, that kind of Friday morning thing, if you want, but that's kind of a little late. That's right before your presentation. So, uh, Tuesdays are good for me. Give you a couple of days to kind of process some things. Um, let me know what your week looks like and I'll try to, I'll try to move some things around so that. We can sort of lay down some groundwork. Okay. I'll send you an email. Great. Okay. Everybody feeling good. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much for all of you. Um, also, this is recording, so if you want to take a look at this and and uh, review it, then you guys will have it at your fingertips. Uh, thank you again, Brian. You're um, welcome. Thank you for having me. And there, I will invite all of our guest speakers, Brian included, when you guys do the presentations, um, if he's able to make it. Um, so that that'll come your way. Thank um, you. So it's an honor, and it'll be very much like this. So <laughs> it'll be half WebEx and half face to face. So. Okay. And I don't know which half is half.